welcome to the Ice House podcast. Uh, I'm Bryce Stewart, the community manager at the Ice House, and I have another awesome in-person conversation today with Ray Everest, co-founder of Future Focus. And Ray is based in the Bay of Plenty, and because of that, has done our Bay of Plenty business owner program, which we call Bop Bop. It works. Um, Ray is a co- the co-founder of Future Focus, which is an early learning centre, and so I'm really excited to see what that journey has looked like as a business owner and what the future looked like. So welcome, Ray. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I'm really uh, grateful for being able to catch up and have a yarn. So good. Looking forward to the combo. Uh, we like to sort of start some of our podcasts with some quick fire questions yep. to help get to know the person. So quick fire question. First one, you've got one right in front of you as yeah. we speak. What is your coffee order? <laughs> yeah, uh, I only really come into being a coffee drinker in the last kind of couple of years. So cool. I think it was more the social aspect than the taste. Uh, but I am a flat white Yeah. Um, with regular milk. Um, but uh, look, I'm not fussy. <laughs> That's a strong order for someone that hasn't. You know, normally people come in with the mocha. Mocha or something, And yeah, then they, yeah. they graduate to the flat white, yeah. but it looks like you've just gone straight But there. I generally uh, water it down with a turmeric tea or something of that ilk. Um, yeah, on the side. So, yeah. Nice. Nicely done. Cool. Uh, what are you listening to or reading right now? Um, yeah, good question. I read and listen regularly. Cool. Um, to I've generally got multiple things going on um, as of now um, I always listen to um, Coaching for Leaders which is Dave Stahoviak um, 500 plus episodes wow. he's just phenomenal he's, um, yeah and he there's some pretty critical podcasts that I've shared um, from him he's just fantastic Mm-hmm. Um, how I built this is probably one thing I'm really reading right, uh, listening to right now. Um, kind of, I came across that because I had finished uh, Masters of Scale. So Masters of Scale was phenomenal. That's with Reid Hoffman, the creator, co-creator of LinkedIn. Oh wow! So and he interviews. Just the style's really cool. Um, I love. Um, Super Soul Sundays with mm-hmm. Oprah Winfrey and anything from Brene Brown. Yeah. Um, yeah. Man, there's some the, some strong players right there. That yeah, some very to. strong players. That's epic. Um, and then um, reading wise, generally, um, so I'm reading of Dan Pink's um, books, um, but basically um, anything from sort of those sort of leadership type scenarios. Mm-hmm. In terms of fun, right now I'm actually reading A Ride of a Lifetime with um, Robert Iger, Bob Iger, who mm. was the CEO of Disney. Ah, cool, yes, um, heard of that one. So uh, that's pretty cool. And um, in terms of workbooks that I'm, re- that I'm working through right now, um, I'm reading um, Key Person of Interest. Um, that got shared to me by a good friend of mine, Russell, and um, it's brilliantly put together because it's got... That's what I was doing when you saw it random to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's set out in a way to to look at how to bring your own vitality and energy to sort of corner off what you're doing and, and put yourself as being a key person of interest within your mm-hmm. chosen fields. Yeah. But it's really written beautifully because it's done in a way that it, you have to work through mm-hmm. stuff. So at the moment, what I was writing there, what they've got you to do is go back through and... Um, do a timeline of your life, mm. um, high and low points, mm. and it's crazy. You start seeing themes mm. and what stands out. I've got quite a strong memory, so um, I've gone right back, and I'm only up to intermediate at Whoa. the moment. Wow! <laughs> uh, and then there's some pretty cool moments and some yeah pretty low moments, and mm. yeah. Um, so yeah, I've Whoa. generally got something. Yeah, you got a always, lot on the go, which yeah. is inspiring. Lots that yeah. people could pick out from that and, yeah. and start reading. There's some gems themselves. in those podcasts there yeah. for sure. That's so good. That's awesome answer. Um, first place that you'll travel to when the borders open. Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, look, must I'm 40 this year, and nice. I'm not really a fan of hosting big parties and things like that. I think. A waste of money. Um, <laughs> well, so I've got two children. Um, well, sorry, I've got. I've actually got three children, but two children live with us. Um, yeah. I've got an older son, Cortez, um, but awesome. Marlo and Frankie are nearly five, and 
Marlo 7 and um, we'd, we'd love to go to America, go to go to New York. Cool. That was our, we travelled end of 2019 to California, Hawaii um, yep. and then obviously the pandemic came in yep. so we, we haven't been anywhere. Yeah. But cool. yeah, I think we've never been to New York. Um, we've travelled pretty extensively but I don't know, it's funny, we were writing this yesterday, uh, Courtney and I, and there's something about the American dream mm. that really drags, wants to drag me to New York. Mm. Recently read Will Smith's book. Oh, cool. Um, which, again, is amazing, because yeah. um, I really cool. idolise Will Smith. Um, and just, yeah, something about New York. So Something cool. about it. So we want to spend a month or five weeks there and take them at Christmas because it's cold. Yeah, yeah. Girls, what a cool experience. They watch TV and they see Christmas being snow, so yeah. they're at a point now where they'll kind of comprehend a lot of that stuff. So, so, so hopefully we'll see how it goes. It's just the, it's just the um, yeah, what the MIQ scenario looks like in spaces, but hopefully it's done by then. Yeah, yeah, exciting. That mm. sounds like an exciting trip. Also, can we take a moment for how cool your kids' names are? Thank you. <laughs> that yeah. is awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so so good. Um, cool. What was the first career that you dreamed of having as a kid? Yeah, um, good question. Pretty, it came aware to me that I really would wanted to be a teacher mm. with um, at about year eight or form two as. To some of the older people listening um, I had a teacher called Mr Dodds Mark Dodds mm-hmm. he was very firm but fair he was a lot of fun uh, he had a deep care mm. um, and it was probably a piece that was missing out of my own life in that time and I remember he left mm. um, teaching um, in the last term and I remember bawling my eyes out Aww. when he left wow. um, he was probably my real first inspiration around wanting to be a teacher. Then as I got through my, I did two, I went to two high schools, uh, but my original high school, I'm from Tukuroa, um, I went there and I got very frustrated with what teachers were doing. Um, and so the dream went from being a teacher because of what Mr. Dodds was, to being a teacher because I knew I could be better than who was currently teaching me. Wow. Um, it was quite a, early realization in that piece um and it wasn't because of content or knowledge or it was just approach really frustrated me um but uh, yeah some things some key things happened at that time and then um yeah uh, then i met mrs waddell when i went to the i went to st paul's in hamilton i got an opportunity through a sports scholarship there and Mrs. Waddell was, she clearly said to me, and I could still see her saying it to me, she said, because I was took, taken up there for rugby and mm. athletics, and she was, I remember her, because I won speech competition in year, in year 12, six, and it was right at the start of the year, she said, um, Ray, you're not just a bullfed, mm-hmm. you've actually got a brain, you've just got to use it. Mm, wow. um, and that That's really, good. that really, really stood out to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that was probably the realisation there. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's probably, I knew I didn't want to be in the military because my, my dad's side was all military, my brother went military. Ah, interesting. Because yeah. I didn't really cope well um, in that, being told what to do, I guess, yeah. probably the best way of saying it. <laughs> but then in saying that there were pieces of my childhood, and as I've even re- recollected on my notes, um, where I th- there was quite an entrepreneurial spirit in me. Yeah. Um, so. But a lot of it was not around making money. It was about sharing times with people mm. and facilitating moments. Mm. So, yes, I was making money, um, but it was generally shared amongst my friends for video games and ice creams and things things that we didn't have access to growing up in Tupperware because a lot of us came from really working class families mm. so it wasn't readily available to just go out and ask mum and dad for ten dollars to go and buy ice mm. cream and video games and things yeah you had to go and figure that out yourself and yeah yeah um, so i guess that piece lived in me i just didn't have a word called entrepreneur yeah yeah That's so interesting eh? yeah That's so, so interesting and cool that it's you've actually carried through in that industry of work which is yeah we'll get into very yeah. shortly um last sort of of our quick five questions when are you most relaxed oh yeah um 
I'm generally la- relaxed guy. Yeah. But this just this morning, like um, I've seen some stuff come through in our business, and it's it's a it's a general love and care for kids and families, and I take the time to message those teachers and tell them. Mm. I let them know, like I let Bex know this morning that I love your approach. I love how you get down to their level. Cool. I love the connection. I'm very relaxed when I'm doing that because it's genuine. So okay. good. Um, but then in saying that, you know, like playing cards, with, you know, my daughters are coming to a point where they're like card games. Marlo and I, every night we play a game called Othello. I don't know if you know um, the game. Uh, um, some, again, it's an old game. <laughs> So her and I play that every night. Yeah. Um, Courtney and I, my wife and I, we're probably, in terms of her and I, we're really relaxed when we are talking about business because mm. we love it. That's cool. You know, um, and I coach weightlifting. Oh, um, wow. I coach the sport of weightlifting and have coached for many years and I've competed myself for many years. Um, yeah. I guess when you say relaxed, I think of times of flow mm-hmm. where things, where, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. That's makes the, sense. that's probably the best way of explaining. You know, those 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 points of the day are when I really am in flow. Yeah. 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 No, that's a great way of putting it. I even hadn't thought about it like that. But when you feel like you're in your flow, you're just like, yeah, yeah. life is good. Yeah. No, but you got to get out and make that. that so yeah. my routine in the morning, which I know we'll get to, but my routine in the mornings, I'm pretty rigid. Yeah. In terms of what I do. Cool. Um, and that's always trying to. People talk about trying to find flow. I I generally try to believe in making flow. Yeah. Um, making opportunity to flow. Uh, that's why I took time to come across here earlier. Yeah. Um, to just because I can sit down. No one knows who I am. So I can just good. sit there and get through some stuff and enjoy what's going on. So mm. awesome. So mm. so cool. Oh, I'm learning so much about you already. Which is so <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to go that little bit, that little bit further. Tell me about yourself. Who is Ray Everest? Yeah, so born and bred in Tokoroa, um, Waikato town. Um, I am of Ngāti Raukaua, Ngāti Ahuru mm-hmm. descent. Uh, my marae is Ngāti Ra, which is on Ngāti Ra Road in Litchfield, between Pataru and Tokoroa. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I am one of three siblings, mm-hmm. uh, but I am quite a little bit younger than, than my... I guess I was an afterthought. Um, <laughs> yeah. So working class family um my dad worked out at the mill in Tokoroa which is what most people was kind of almost the rite of passage back then for families mm-hmm. uh, my mum is and he's originally from Christchurch my mum is originally from Tokoroa um born and bred there too so mm-hmm. yeah um always been pretty out there driven kind of yeah, I think I the best way of saying it was life of the party type guy. Cool. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but yeah, massively driven um, in terms of creating scenarios of fun and success. Um, mm-hmm. But never not driven by money because it was a it was a um, yeah. I guess that's the real fascinating thing about this conversation in business is because. A lot of what has driven me in my success um, has never been money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Although, um, and that comes from where money was never spoken about in our house because it was tight or mm-hmm. not there, or um, and so mm-hmm. that sort of financial piece um, wasn't really supported. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, never knew a business owner, never knew a doctor, never knew a lawyer. You know, you never know people who you put into saying wealth and in, in that space. Mm. Um, so it was such a strange thing getting into business and stuff myself and understanding that. So, mm, so interesting. Um, sports always been a big piece. Uh, I am, although I've had a pretty fair idea. Um, I am diagnosed high ADHD. Mm-hmm. But sport was my saviour, probably when I was at school. Yeah. Um, and and as I left the structure of school, it did get harder. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, I was a dad at sixteen. Wow. So Corte is my son. Is twenty three next month. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not planned, obviously. Yeah. Um, and pretty rocky between his mother and I. Yeah. Um, the whole time through. So all of a sudden, I became an adult, um, and really. Um, the desire to be something mm-hmm. in my life really took 
a, um, a, a sharp turn. Yeah, did that impact your um, thinking of your future and how important it was? Yeah, massively. Yeah. Because I wanted to be part of Cortez's life. I, um, I wanted to make him proud. Um, I wanted to, which was which is not me today, but back then I was determined to prove people wrong, yeah. including my my mum who, and don't get me wrong, I love my mum, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know she was, um, yeah, they were devastated, mm. but you know, told me I'd ruined my life, all those sorts of things. So yeah, um, mm. I really wanted to make sure that I had something lined up for Cortez to be proud of once wow. he came round, and wow. so. Did I have teenage years? Partly, but it was a very confusing and tough time. Um, and yeah, mm. I'm just proud of myself that the resilience to push through and be part of Cortez's life the whole way through. And um, that's a pure like that. resi- resilience yeah. uh, through that um, to be 16. And like you're saying, did you have teenage years? You know, sort of. But I tried really, to. Yeah, yeah, you know, but really, but, but like take 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 going to a having a like what normal teenagers do and having boyfriend and girlfriend and yeah I had girlfriends or stuff like that but you know it was conscious in my mind like I'm not making a 16 year or a 17 year old girl a stepmother yeah, like uh, I was yeah. so conscious of that um, and even with my wife Courtney you know there was a point where because we met when she was 22 like there was a point where I was almost refusing to have a relationship because I'm like, no, I'm not making, you're 22. Mm, I'm not yeah. making you an overnight step mum. Mm. Um, you've got your life to live and things like that. And obviously it's worked out because her and I are still together, but mm, totally. you, you know what I mean? Like yeah. those sorts of things. So that's a big chunk of my life that, um, that has really driven a lot of my um, drive in terms of being someone for Cortez. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 So, but I'm a pretty happy go lucky fella. Yeah, um, yeah. My school reports would say I class clown <laughs> would do better if you know Stop concentrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you're in your zone now. This, is, <laughs> yeah. this is the best place to just keep on talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got that in some of my school reports. She'd do good if she stopped talking so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so interesting to hear that backstory because I think it is so important to you know set the the following questions up you know with context mm. and um, understanding of what's driven you mm. um you know starting co-founding the the business and mm. um, driving you to what success looks like to you right and in many of our conversations we talk about you know success actually looks so different to every person some people it is finances some people it's freedom of being able to make decisions um others it's because of family or um yeah situations like that that they need to sort of they want the children to look back and say, hey, I'm thankful for setting me up for one. So, um, yeah, it's really inspiring and really cool to sort of get to know that mm. more. In terms of your uh, your um, your career journey, how's, how's that panned out? So where did that start and what led to future? Yeah, things? so I went from, because my year 11, my fifth form, my, um, obviously it come out that uh, Rano, Cortez's mum and I, you know, that she got pregnant, um, yeah, it was a real. Mm. When I look back at that year in '98, yeah, I, th- I think back to how teachers treated mm. me as well. Um, and, you know, just this, not a disdain, but a just a shake of it because I was joining numbers of of many Tokoroa family um, mm. kids that ended up the same way. Yeah, and. Uh, I don't think I was ever looked at as an academic by teachers. Um, I think they always thought I'd turn into something in sport, but as I left school, I actually realised I didn't enjoy sport, I enjoyed people. Mm. Um, wow. Um, and it was um, a real interesting period of my life where I had to navigate through wanting people's opinions but letting them really take an effect on me mm. in terms of my own, you know, mental health was not a word in 98, yeah, so it yeah. wasn't a thing. Right. Um, so it shaped a lot of my career because I was never gonna treat kids like that. Mm. Um, you know, we as kids made choices and um, the brain's not even developed properly by that point. Yeah, um, yeah, totally. So what what it meant is that I 
I failed um, school C quite miserably, um, which is which was like level ones today. Yeah. And I went to St Paul's. I got the chance to go to St Paul's and um, kind of turn my life around. It was the way it looked. Was seen. and I, and I'll admit, like St Paul's really changed my life. Um, mm. It was just the the level of care was fantastic and. Uh, people like Mr. Henley Smith, Mr. Wilson, um, Mr. Fenton, Mr. Penny, you know, they were just, um, they were just quality people. Mm, wow. And they vouched for me and looked after me and then Mrs. Waddell added her as a teacher and, and meant kind of mentor in a way. Um, you know, it, it was it was phenomenal to see the the contrast. Mm. So there was a school that was saying I'd thrown everything away, and there was a school saying, "Hey, you've actually got still got a lot ahead of you." Wow, well, yeah. And it's quite a contrast um, in, in approach. Yeah. So, yeah, I I'd made the decision to not go to the military. Everyone had said I should just go to the military, mm-hmm. and I decided I was going to uni, but I had to earn three Cs. So. Mm. Um, <laughs> so in my last year of school what I actually did was I only enrolled in three subjects I was meant to enroll in six no one found out until <laughs> term two Yeah. and I remember being called into the office and them saying um, you need to do six subjects mm. Mr. Early was saying that. I said but Mr. I only need three I only need three C's then I get to go to uni mm. no no you, you have to do six Mm. I was like, I'm not doing six. Mm. I, I have to do, I, all I need is three C's and I can go to uni and study to be a teacher. And they let me do it. Wow. So, right. and, I, and I got it. Because you, you knew that if you had three subjects to focus on, you mm. could give your all to the three and yeah. then you could get through rather than six and hope for the best. Which is a thing. real common thread of my life. Clever. And I yeah. talk about it being in my alleyway. Mm. I just, you know... James Clear, and he talks about you know, just narrow the focus. Yeah. You know, inc- you know, improve the quality, increase the speed. Yeah. I, I've been very good at that from a very young age. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, I manipulated the scenario there to to create a scenario where it was going to be successful for me, even though it was really against the the, the structure of the school. Mm-hmm. And I achieved it. Mm-hmm. And great. And I went to uni and, and became a teacher. But within the first year of university, I when I started going out to practicums and placements with schools, I recognised actually teachers aren't, don't get to do their best because the damn principals, not letting them be who they wanted to be. Mm-hmm. By the first year of my university, I'd already said to people, I'm going to be a principal, really young. <laughs> wow. And people doubted me, people rubbished me. People were like, oh, you'll get there because you're Māori, you're male. You're probably getting your university for free because you're Māori. All this stuff that really um, drove me to be something further mm. and throw in the fact I was trying to be something for Cortez. Um, yeah, it was a rapid rise. I, I started out a new entrance um, that was real foreign in 2004. Finding a male Māori yeah. in new entrance was like... Wow. In fact, put it this way, my first ever course I went to in the first term of my teaching career, there are a whole bunch of ladies in there. They asked me to go and get biscuits. They thought I was the help. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Because it was so foreign yeah, to yeah. find a male Māori wow. in New Entrance. Um, but I took the job in New Entrance because I said to Jan Whaley, who was my mentor at the time in teaching, she, I said, she said, why are you coming in here? I said, because I want to be school principal as fast as possible. How can I help these people? if I don't know what the job entails by being a new entrant teacher. Brilliant. And and that was, again, me very narrow, very focused on what that was. Did that for a couple of years, then moved to year seven, eight, and within the same school, three and a half years in, got my principal's job, first principal's job. Um, so I was 26. Wow. So dad 26, at 16. 26, yeah. yeah, as a principal. Yeah, dad at 16, principal at 26. 10 years, wow. Um, and... Yeah, that was uh, quite meteoric, uh, you know, but, but in saying that, <laughs> yeah, then I got about 11 months in and realised I absolutely hated that job. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The bureaucracy, yeah, being told what to do, yeah. me trying to facilitate 
an opportunity for teachers to be who they want to be, to do what they want to do. Mm. It just, it was just a hiding to nothing. So, yeah, luckily I'd met Courtney by that time. Yeah. Um, met her in London and then, yeah, it was, but then it just, I went through, uh, I kind of lost hope in education. Yeah. Because just so much confine and teachers burning out and, yeah, man, but that's what I carry, that sort of legacy. Mm. Yeah, I carry that through our business today. Yeah, wow, mm. that's so interesting. Cool that you you sort of worked that out quickly, you know, yeah. for yourself and could still hold on that season of life into what you're doing now, but realise it wasn't where you wanted to spend, you know, the next 30 years, so... And I admire principals. I do admire oh, yeah. them. I think their jobs... I remember reading a stat, like, um, principals have the second highest mortality rate in the country. Wow. Dentistry was first. Yeah, I actually knew that one. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Crazy. Um, but, yeah. Because mm. I was a leader that was, and my leadership style back then was follow me. Mm. You know, um, I'll do everything. Mm. It doesn't work. No. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, you can't sustain that. Mm. Um, and I realized that very early on. I did some great things at Tiako, the school I was principal at, which is in Hamilton. But I did some great things. Um, mm. I shivers, um, yeah, I ran at very low levels of energy. Yeah. Um, there, yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, what does, yeah, tell us about Future Focus and what that's all about. So, the backstory to that really is I've ran out of time for education. Mm. I was tired of the bureaucracy and the doing stuff that did not matter for kids you know marking and rubbish reports and <laughs> stuff like that mm. um, I admired teachers um, I admired the, the patience and passion and, and, and perseverance that we do and, and at that point I, this was in 2013 14 we just got back from living in Doha Courtney and I and um, in Qatar mm-hmm. um, and I had aspirations to work out South Auckland mm-hmm. so worked at Monday to Winter Media but anyway mm. long story short um, once I decided to leave Courtney was always like um, how do we own a school well. why don't you start your own school and I was like yeah okay so we looked into chartered schools and things like that and at the time we just didn't have that sort of volume of capital Mm. To, to invest in that sort of space um, but we found out that you can own early childhood centres and I thought well I've taught right through to year 13s mm. I haven't taught down there mm. let's have a go so, so great. fast forward um, we managed to acquire some land down here in Papa Moa. we were living in Auckland at the time and then um, yeah Future Focus was born um, so the name Future Focus is as was it's what it states um it's it's around focusing on what our future is going to be and that's obviously an investment in children yeah um and it's yeah it's it's crazy because there's a lot of people doing early learning centers so mm-hmm. uh, you know there's there's many out there and probably some with, with just as cool as stories as mine um but our real alleyway our real narrow the focus is our teachers Mm. we make no illusions when meeting parents that we are here to look after our teachers our teachers come first Mm, Um, we go into back for our teachers all the time and it's hard because you're dealing with with people and their own struggles in life and they're not um, the greatest paying jobs we're always fighting to be able to pay them more and more Um, um, but a lot of it, it comes down to many teachers it's a calling mm. it's a passion and what we really are about we are the best way to say this is we are a teacher development company in the space of early childhood so good a- as of now yeah as of now yeah right now yeah as of today mm-hmm. we have got grand plans around what that looks like Mm. And that includes expansion, growth opportunities. We've got three centres within three years. Wow. We're just building our fourth right now. We've got many more sites coming, especially around Tauranga Moana and Papa Moa specifically. 
Uh, but the best way to explain our business is we are a teacher development company mm. working currently in the space of early childhood. Wow. Which ties in so brilliantly with your history and your background. I know. And your passion. Yeah. yeah. How good. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I only realised that through Ice House. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only realised what we were doing. I, I remember the day. I've still got... Uh, this, is my, this is my notebook from this year, but... Yeah. I remember the day writing it down. Yeah. When Jane was saying, like, what, what, at the core, what do you do? Yeah. And, and I remember just like, like yeah. yes, I've, I've actually figured this out. Yeah, yeah. You know? So good. Because what that Come focus on. now has done for me, mm. now we've got a bit of R&D going in around what the product looks like to, to branch. Because mm. if we really want to be about teachers mm. and continually fighting for teachers, then we've got to find more ways to bring them to the table. Mm. So but we want to be the table. Yeah, so good. You know? Yeah. And there's multiple sets of tables. Mm-hmm. One of them currently is early childhood. Mm. But we're looking at other seats to put around that table. Mm. And it's future focus. The, the, the name is designed to, to be encompassing, not specific. Yeah, yeah. And our vision, a place to belong. That vision is very strong through our centres. Yeah through our leadership teams, through our staff, constantly looking for ways to help people feel like this is where I was meant to be. Mm. And that's such an important piece of the puzzle because that's what I longed for in my life. Yeah, Always looking for places to belong. That's what I mean about sport. Mm-hmm. It wasn't the sport. Mm. It was the people. Yeah, And that even though I'm in a competitive space in terms of weightlifting, I think if you if you um, spoke to the team I coach, a lot of them would would suggest, look, Ray really is about us as a people as people first, not not weightlifters. It's just that we are weightlifters. The vehicle is weightlifting, yeah. but we are people. So, Brilliant. yeah, it's 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 been a yeah cool journey right then up to then to realise what really oh. what we are doing. It's so inspiring. It is so so inspiring just to see how it's all pieced together over many years now um, yeah. it's pretty cool I've been in education 20, nearly 20 years or 18 years so good well actually if I'm being honest I've been in it since I was 5 so, yeah 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 um, <laughs> but uh, that, that that theme mm. is constant mm. yeah so great what is what's one of the biggest challenges that you've had and and what did you learn from it either business or personal or however mm. you take that question yeah, I've got two. Obviously, I've spoken about being a teenage dad, yeah. and in a in a in a scenario of um, where that challenged me is, I, the perception within the within communities and within we, we I just became another stat. Yeah, you know, Marty, teenage father, um, you know, that sort of scenario uh, really bugged me. Mm. Um, that was tough. Uh, and I was lucky my parents supported me from places and I had some very key people like Mr. Wilson who's a house master at St. Paul's used to let me bring Cortez up mm, wow. and put him, put us in a room in his house. Wow, cool. You know, like, um, it was like, it was, it was tough. Mm, yeah. um, and I, I didn't give up opportunities but I turned down things because I wanted to be there for Cortez mm. and um, yeah um, but I don't regret any of that yeah yeah because it is who I am so which is pretty loyal mm. um, so that was tough yeah of course yeah recently uh, so Courtney and I started the business together mm-hmm. we had not worked together yes interesting dynamic mm. Mm. so initially it was very hard um, because Courtney's so Courtney's background is she's um, come from a background in, in HR and business um, she's worked within her family as well as um, in businesses overseas when we were living overseas yeah um, probably one of the smartest people I know um, and um, where where we really because I am quite out there in terms of my vision and thought and what where I need to head where, where the business needs to head and she's 
had our own perceptions. We had to figure out what that looked like. Mm. So we actually went to um, went to see a psychologist and sat down and talked through all that because yeah. we were really, really driving into each other's um, arenas yeah. um, and not um, not quite letting each other flourish. My ADHD brain is sometimes tangent; it just just flies off, and and that was hard for Courtney to manage in a business setting. And we were, of course, you, as any startup, you're trying to make sure you're not blowing money and yeah. getting getting financially viable. And then a damn pandemic came in, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That was prop, that was really tough. But man, coming through the other side, because mm. Courtney and I are deeply committed to one another in that space, man. We have, and it's like my relationship with Cortez. You go through the tough, mm-hmm. and now you know we're riding the wave, and and but that was hard because we had to figure out where each other, um, where each other's arena was, mm-hmm. um, and how do we bring the best out of each other, as well as supporting the growth pieces, mm-hmm. and that takes a lot of vulnerability. That takes a lot more unpacking around why does that sort of thing bother me so deeply you know why when I make a decision or Courtney makes a decision does that bother them that they feel like they need to challenge it Mm -hmm. you have to be real truthful and honest but now you know I I spoke to someone who has worked with their wife for 50 years and he said to me Ray it's not unique but being successful at it is very rare Yeah, yeah and yeah that's been a huge challenge, but Courtney and I, we we are really in constant flow now in that space because we recognise um, what each other's capabilities are mm. and where we need support. Yeah, wow, that's so cool. I love that. And I can imagine knowing now a lot of context, you know, from how uh, your history and, and your journey to get there, that you would have taken that opportunity to succeed mm. um, and, and run with it and done all that you could, you know, gone to see someone to talk. Yeah. Not many people actually just actually yeah. go see someone to talk through the dynamics of play of when you're working with your partner. Um, maybe not even, um, you know, life partner, but even in terms of just a business partner, yeah. there are different pe- uh, different personalities at play, different emotions going around. Actually, a great practical tip from you, go talk to someone about yeah. it, sit down, talk it out, go through the low to get to the high, you know? Yeah, the bi- you've got to remove the bias and you've got mm. to remove the subjectivity. Mm. The, the, um, and we just saw him locally, like he, he, he was just like... So good. He was so cut and dry around aspects and it just helped massively. Like, um, but Courtney and I are like that. Mm. We we seek out, op- we seek out opportunities for growth all the time. Mm. Um, but that was a critical piece to our business mm. because we are um, we are focused on on very specific set of things. So we have to make sure we have the ability to talk. But but Courtney and I, we're parents. We obviously yeah. husband and wife, lovers. We're, um, we're in business. Um, I coach her in weightlifting. She started weightlifting. We're looking. We're always looking for. So everything we do in the day, we are involved with yeah. in each other. Wow. Um, in different realms. Yeah. Different so, hats. Yeah, different hats. Mm, cool. But that was tough, but massively rewarding. Yeah, such a great answer. That's so cool. Would love to know one of your biggest highlights in your business journey today. Mm. Um. Oh, I think look, making money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's always the the scary piece of any sort of startup. Yeah, actually being profitable. That's but and that's a simple one. Now look, the highlights for our business right now are that both Courtney and I agree that we must remove our DNA from the business for it to really take the to reach the potential and and go at the speed that it's capable of. Mm. We have gone from one to three centres within. Th- Within a well, it was actually within a two and a bit year period, um, and sticking to that kind of mantra of teach development, all of our leadership team are from within. We have not brought someone externally. Great. Um, we are just we've just promoted um, Lucy into she will be centre leader in our new centre in Papua Moa, mm-hmm. and um, our development piece around growing leaders and them feeling supported is is huge so it's our acknowledgement the the piece i'm most proud of it's our acknowledgement that we need to get the hell out of the way 
because mm-hmm. there are people that are far more brilliant in aspects than we are. Mm-hmm. So because of that, we have to drop ego mm-hmm. um, and we have to empower them to make decisions, to live with decisions and not, um, you know, not come down on them when they get things wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's such, um, it's, it's not unique but it is a foreign concept for many business owners to hear me talk about removing myself from the business. Mm-hmm. And it's not because we don't want to work. That's, yeah. That is not, that is not, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Courtney and I love work. Yeah. Um, but you want to empower your people, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we want, to, we want to stick to what we're good at, which is relationships. And we want to continue to acquisition. We want to continue to find opportunities to grow and, and again bring those different seats to the table yeah, great. Um, and if we are involved in the day to day decision making it draws energy mm-hmm. it steals energy sometimes and that's just we can't live in that way because then we won't be able to make clear calls on how the business is going mm-hmm. or where it needs to go mm-hmm. um, yeah yeah, yeah. It's so, the whole on or in, you know, working on the business or yeah. the business. Yeah. But, it, but even, even in that sense, in the on place, I've challenged a lot of that because working on the business is not, oh, for me personally, I don't think that's a thing these days with, with growing businesses. You know, I, um, you can work on, because the product is pretty straightforward. It's, it's, teach, it's working with children. That, that's the product right now. Yeah. And for our product is, when we're teachers so where we can get the most value is we work with our leaders yeah and constantly okay. constantly engage with the leaders so that they can you know uh, Howard Schultz if you don't know who he is he's the um, creator well not creator but he is the Starbucks man yeah um, and he always talks about you've got to exceed the expectations of your people mm-hmm. so they can exceed the expectations of their people yeah. we do that we right. do that constantly and if we if our DNA is too much within the confines and contracts of the business it gets in the way of us being able to do that because mm. then I've got to have a finger over here and finger in and I don't yeah. Yeah. I don't like that nor do I agree with it mm. um, especially true. because on the coal face our leaders are doing the hard work with the teams with yeah. the people yeah mm. no, so interesting so so good yeah um so much gold thank you what motivates you to get up in the morning and do you have any routines that you put in place to set yourself up for a win I know yeah. you do because yeah. you mentioned it but we'd love yeah. to hear so, about it you can't see it but I, my <laughs> headphones yes. uh, my, my iPods so they sit on my phone in the morning oh, they, they sit on my phone so when I wake up I see my iPods I pick them up put them in yeah. and I generally start listening to podcasts wow so James Clear, everyone, I'm sure if you haven't Reading read Atomic, book. if you Reading. haven't read Atomic Habits, if there's a business book, a leadership book, a life book, that would be if there's something I gift to people often, there's Atomic Habits. Yeah, I'm at chapter three, so I'm just starting the journey, and it's yeah. incredible. Like my mind is blown. It's changed how I do things. Yeah. Or listen to him talk even further. Cool. You know, follow his social media. Yeah. Sign up for his email. Mm. There's, but that's the atomic habit is I, I sit my headphones on my phone. Yeah. So the first, because what I used to do back in the day is just leave it like that and what's the first thing I do is pick it up and scroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I leave it like that because Courtney and I, and actually our family, we're all early risers. We're generally up by 5.36. Wow. And uh, yeah. Cool. I pick it up and yeah, I, so I keep, I generally keep, I've got a good playlists, but I keep, people can't see what I've got a diary, but I keep um, all my podcasts and notes and things that I'm listening to. Wow. Um, that's just from this year, but I, I, I do it because generally I'm listening to something awesome. Mm, so like I'm good. listening to, um, about the creative voice, um, you know, on how I built this, but mm. I, I love starting the day with that stuff. Mm. Monday, um, I always play. Uh, I always put on my social media this clip of Ric Flair. Um, Ric Flair was a wrestler. There's a, yeah, there's, it's a, it's a really kind of high energy clip. I put that religiously on my Monday, and on Friday I religiously put up. I have done for since pre lockdown that clip of. It's Friday, Friday then, then, it's Saturday, Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, what? seriously, I I have not missed a Friday in close to. 
two years. <laughs> that's gold. That yeah. was our Friday song in lockdown. Yeah. We were in <laughs> that, that's where I think I found it. Yeah. So and I have religiously, <laughs> Monday and Friday, put those sorts of things up. Mm. Um, but you know what? Spending time with my children, mm. my my parents, my dad especially was a, was always at work and hard working and. I know that if he could change anything in his life, it would be to probably spend more time with his kids. Yeah, wow. So, you know, I get to drop my daughter off at school. Um, Frankie comes with us to the daycare, but she's nearly about to start school. Mm-hmm. You know, start in the morning, having breakfast, not in a rush. Yeah. Time, freedom to make some breakfast and, and put music on and, you know, help them and just be with them mm-hmm. is a... a something a privilege and piece of gratitude um, that I'm really proud of and and most and, and every morning is always a gratitude piece right mm, yeah, yeah be thankful for something yeah be thankful for something and because it, it either puts you in a position where you're thankful or you've got to realize you've got to go out and find something to be grateful for mm. so oh so good but that's that sort of stuff's pretty routined yeah yeah, even if it's five minutes of a podcast or two minutes mm. before Frankie or Marlo comes in, and then I, you know, so I don't just usher them away. I, I, I take it out when they're coming because they're, yeah. they're coming in for a cuddle and hug and yeah, totally things like that. So wow, yeah, you can just you can just see it and and hear it flow through you in terms of you know the incredible quotes that you have from incredible minds just embedded yeah. into yours. You know, yeah, it's so yeah. cool that it's been able to impact who you are as a person and your leadership style, I'm sure. So Reson- those good. things resonate. Yeah. And they resonate to me when I was eight-year-old Ray mm. to nearly 40-year-old Ray. Mm. I, I tie them to people that I know that had big pieces, you know, another Howard Schultz quote um, he because I often get challenged by people in saying for our own growth aspirations mm-hmm. people, people often say to me but how are you going to do it because it's you how, how, how do you replicate you right mm-hmm. and that challenge almost irritates me because mm-hmm. they, they think that our business is built on me mm-hmm. and it's not yeah it's built on the vision it's built on the story yeah and that's quite um, you know that's very very important for being Māori is that story mm-hmm. we all fuck a papa back from something and it's so important mm-hmm. but Howard Schultz talks about how do you get big and stay small mm-hmm. that's what he, that's one thing he says and keep in mind they're like a 25 billion dollar annually business mm-hmm. but, yeah. <laughs> but when you listen to Howard Schultz he, he did a really cool one on Super Soul Sunday with Oprah just hearing his um I'm going to listen to that. Yeah, just hearing his clear, clear vision of what it meant to be part of the Starbucks brand and company mm. and, and where they went wrong and how they addressed it. And they lost the, their vision of which was the experience, not the coffee. Mm. It's the experience. Yeah. You know, those are the things that um, really drive home for me when it comes to running our business or well not running it right now we've got other people who are doing far better jobs than what we could do or what I could do um, but the, the, that permeate through yep. the, the, the the spirit or the wide world of the business yeah yeah that's so cool mm. that's great so so yeah real special um, I'd love to know when did you actually hear about the Ice House and how would you sum up your <laughs> business owner um, program experience? Yeah, I, I shared this with Ben the other day. I already heard about Ice House. How long has Ice House been going? 20 years. Yeah, I reckon. So, in between this, I actually, in between owning um, and starting Future Focus and leaving teaching, we owned a gym. Oh yeah, um, a CrossFit gym. Cool. Um, and well, CrossFit and weightlifting, probably more so the weightlifting side for me. But we own a CrossFit weightlifting gym, and it's called CrossFit MCR, which is now CrossFit Propolis. Mm-hmm. Um, MCR stood for Marlo, Courtney, and Ray. So good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, back then I remember Ice House um, coming up in probably my social media feeds or mm-hmm. something like that. And I was certainly inquisitive and, but you know what I said to Ben, I just thought I had nothing to offer in that realm. Wow. 
And and did the gym do well? No. Did we create some great memories? Yes. Did we learn some pretty harsh lessons about business? Yes. Mm. Um, did I learn some pretty pretty key leadership pieces? Yes. Mm. Um, but I at that point I thought, oh, I've got nothing to offer. Wow. Well. I sell that imposter syndrome. Yeah, I was gonna say. You know, it, it was very, very um, prevalent in my head. Then we started Future Focus, and I remember it coming up again, and I was like, I don't have anything to offer there. Um, again, it goes back to this is nothing to do with what ISAUS does, or, mm. or, or it just is my own um, self esteem issues that still sometimes rear their head around. Mm. What do I know in business? Um, mm. What have I done? Uh, and, and those sorts of things. So, yeah, Courtney finally convinced me and helped me put in the application form. Awesome. And I'm so glad I did. Yeah. I have to get past that. Um, but coming to that and hearing business other business owners and their struggles mm. um, but also their highlights their wins was exceptionally powerful for me um, and had helped me kind of realize that I do belong in this realm um, you know yep. and I've got to get let go of some of that almost trauma from my childhood mm. because it's a worth thing you yeah. know, yeah. not knowing business owners, not knowing, um, you know, like I said, doctors, yeah. lawyers, all that, what, what society deems as successful people. Mm. Um, and crazily, when I got to principalship, I thought I was part of that elite. Mm. You know, I thought, <laughs> here I was, now I'm the principal of a school, and you'd be amazed how many people would meet me and go, well, you're principal, and, yeah. I'd, and I'd be like, yeah, I'm principal, but really, I hated the damn job. Yeah, wow. Well, um, yeah. And I'm like, hang on, I'm part of the elite, but I hate my job. How does that work? Yeah. Do people just stick with it, do they? <laughs> um, so coming into Ice House and hearing Jamie's stories and and hearing the other um, business owners' stories and what was going on was, was a pretty powerful thing for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and that's why I tell the story of the vulnerability, the imposter syndrome, because I know, especially for Māori and Pacifica business owners out there right now, I know that is an issue, that is a very big issue. Mm. There are not clear support systems Mm. outside of iwi-run business for Māori and Pacifica entrepreneurs. Mm. Um, Māori and Pacifica entrepreneurs um, potentially always think that you need to be earning in the millions or more in terms of uh, thinking that they're worth... do I need to be going to that? Yeah, yeah. Or well, I can bring value to that when really there are people out there um, and I can I can name five pretty quick off the top of my head who would be amazing in this program but they they would probably struggle to see their own worth fit into that scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and, thank you for yeah. being a voice. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why I love having people like yourself to bring the diversity of thought and thinking and background and history and culture because... Mm-hmm. I would hope someone would listen to this, either knowing you or uh, you know aligning with you and going, oh, if he can do it, I can do it. Yes, you know? and I think it, it is, it, it's a piece of, if he can do it, I can do it, yep. But it's also a piece of, if he values himself and what he's done in his life, knowing what he's come from. Yes. And I haven't even had a chance to dig into some of the other stuff that went mm. on in my damn life, but mm. th- th- know that your value is within yourself. It's mm. not established from a room of people although that's what the story the the, the corridor I just had around there no it's not it's actually having the courage to just make the move mm-hmm. um, and and know your own value um, so that's continually that that ice house program really helped that I guess my only not frustration was like we two next with ice house mm-hmm. you know like I do I, my brain's like maybe we should be running something specifically for Marty Pacifica mm-hmm. Why, why aren't we? Is there? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, because I know of people out there that would really flourish if they were able to walk into a means that helped them um, feel comfortable. Totally. Mm. Yeah, we, we have scholarships um, for our Māori Pacifica business yeah. owners, which is cool. Great opportunity that we've been able to partner 
um, with an organisation to do that. Um, so may put, I'll put more information um, yeah. in, in the actual um, publishing of this conversation and yeah. talk to you about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's a good point and it's it's cool that that's... Or woman, woman, the other one, you know, like like that's probably the other, my other real major focus is woman. Yeah, yeah. Because there are amazing women out there, yeah. you know. Um, if you haven't listened to any of content from Sarah Blakely, who's um, Spanx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My God, some hearing some of her stories. Yeah. You know, there and and she is a youngest female billionaire, still owns the whole company, mm-hmm. like no and shareholders. Yeah, that's incredible. And here she was living in an apartment, making getting turned down from people, women especially mums, mm. mums. Mm. They're superheroes, man. Yeah, yeah. They're real life so superheroes. Resilient. Yeah. But we cannot do what females do, and that is bring children into the world. Mm. Wow. You know, and, and I guess the respect for my wife was when seeing my own children come into the world, because I was not there for Cortez's birth. Yeah. And, you know, Courtney working up to Friday and giving birth on Monday morning. Like, yeah, wow. She's a superhuman. Yeah. And the, 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 um, the channels for females. To, to walk through um, confidently without having the overbearing, you know, male-dominated society in a corporate world and all that. So female, female approaches are, they will one day change the world. Mm, wow. I'm telling you that because, because they have a far deeper level of empathy mm. and a, a stronger desire to really make sure that their people feel part of something, mm. that they don't often just look at numbers. And that's the rhetoric of successful businesses. Mm. That's what Hollywood pushes when they talk about businesses and, you know, Wolf of Wall Street, all this stuff. Mm. Where are the great movies about women? Mm, so good. You know, and I'm just, that's why I listen to Oprah. Mm. I love her stuff, yeah. storytelling. Yeah. yeah and, and just, she just, I, I really do believe it. And that's why with our business, because all our female, all our leaders are female, yeah. I get out of the way. <laughs> They're far better at it than me. Mm. And so, why get in the way of that? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another real, probably, passion area. So cool. Actually, today at 1 p.m., um, the Art House, um, in partnership with, with one of our alumni, um, female, uh, launching a podcast series um, called A Seat at the Table. So it's so interesting oh, wow. that you, you mentioned that throughout our <laughs> yeah, combo because yeah. I'm sort of going, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But it's all around that div- that idea of diversity of thinking, not just in terms of gender, um, but in terms of, you know, like I said before, your your background, your history, your culture, your um, who you are as a person, um, but gender also. And, yeah. you know, really hoping to have some courageous conversations with people that sort of break down some of those barriers and walls yeah. and misconceptions. So it's, it's great. And, great and it's a, that you. conversation, like, I've got daughters, you know, like I get frustrated when people say to me, oh, you work with, with females. That must be hard moaning and blah blah and I, I actually refute that yeah yeah because if i'm a if i'm a male that calls out something within a business that's not going very well then i'm a hero mm. if a female calls out something in a business then they're just a moaner a moaning bee you know yeah, all that totally. sort of, and, and 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 i don't want my daughters to ever be in a scenario that something's not working something's not right and they call it out and they're just labeled a moaner mm. like that, that would just that would break me. Um, wow. And, and we just can't, we cannot continue to empower that. And that programs like the Ice House give greater light to females in business, um, Māori Pacifica, those sorts of things. It's a, it's a journey that we've got to blow the doors open on. Mm-hmm. Because they will, they will create far more sustainability in our business, personally, females will, mm-hmm. than I ever can. Because... Mm-hmm. It is females working with females and understanding that um, in that space of what people are going through. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for what you're doing in that space, just through um, within your own business. You know, that's where it starts. It's business by business, having yeah. that mindset and um, yeah, that way of thinking. It's it's not always common, you know. Yeah. So, so well, my wife calls me a feminist. Yeah, she does. <laughs> she does. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, 
And it's not because I've got daughters, it's because I do believe we've got to move away from, oh, it's hard working with women, blah, blah, blah. we've got to move mm. away from that. Mm. People have got to check their comments about that stuff. Yeah, fully. And, and be called out on it. Yeah, yeah couldn't mm. agree more. So, so awesome, Ray, thank you. Um, anything that you've implemented into your business since the program, like anything real specific that you went, you heard it from Jamie or someone on, yeah. on the program, and I have actually gone away and popped that into my business. The sales process. Cool. So we had nothing written down. <laughs> yeah. We we kind of relied on um, on telling a story to to almost sell what Future Focus was about, but we have really created a process. Yeah. Um, because we, we had no real process it was like you'd walk in with your children we'd kind of get some names down and we would t- show you around the centre and that was it yeah. whereas now we've got a process in play um, we're continually upgrading that process to in terms of access of information mm-hmm. you know we're right now we're trying to build opportunity to use QR codes because they're very familiar of course, yeah. um, and it means they can use the device and put data that goes into our um, student management systems um, because we've got multiple centres, we want to make sure that um, but this is really lacking because the Ministry of Education is very, very behind. They are mm. very backward. Mm. They are very tech adverse. Um, they are have very hard to deal with in that mm. space. But what we want to do is um, open up all the knowledge or information that comes in so that across the business, we know that someone's walked into the business with two children at this age and this age and where the spaces are available. Yeah. We, that sales process that Jane, that we spoke through was just so powerful because I actually went back, we analysed what it was and basically it was nothing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we have got now a very strong process in so place. Cool. But it's only right at the start Yeah. because what we found is that parents get frustrated when the information is not forthcoming or the delivery is not um, streamlined you know if you're like oh I've come in with my two children and and I've gone and Britt Brit or, or Kelly or Al or myself have spoken to them they're like cool we'll get back to you and then we don't get back to them because mm. we get tied down with something yeah that's that's not good enough yeah. um, because parents there is choice there's a sport for choice around Papa more and so the last thing you want is to lose someone who loved the place but mm. they pick up and go oh man they're slack on delivering information Mm. it's not good enough Mm. so we've tried to almost automate Mm. a large portion of that and and hopefully deliver it in a way so but I hadn't heard of because selling doesn't become doesn't come natural to me telling a story does Um, and that's fine telling the story is great but having a sales process that kind of aligns and is streamlined across all the centers we were, we were drastically missing that. Mm. Mm. Oh, man, that's so good. Cool that, you know, a session you can walk away from and actually transform yep. um, your your customers or community's experience with you yeah. pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So because cool. when it comes back to it, we want, we know that our teachers bring the vibe when people come in and talk. And often we look for the conversation of, man, it's such a good vibe here or family feel or whatever. Mm-hmm. But you can quickly let people down if the professionalism of this of that sales process is not mm. clear transparent and and quick because mm. people want stuff yesterday yeah yeah well yeah yeah so true gold awesome any advice yeah wrapping up the last couple of questions now any advice you would give a business owner right now something that's stuck with you yeah uh, Find people that are brilliant and put them and replace yourself with them. So good, yeah. Just find find brilliance. Because I found there are many brilliant people that don't have the bravery to go out on their own. Mm. But once you get them in an environment of thriving, you know, um, you've got to empower them to be that way. So in weightlifting, I used to be coached by a guy called Glenn Penlay, and he's passed away now, but American guy... At the time, there were no real. It was real hard to find a coach for weightlifting because it was such a niche sport mm-hmm. in New Zealand, and there were only about fourteen clubs at the time, and it was very hard to find a coach. So I went online, and he was quite an entrepreneur himself. Um, but his piece of advice, as I started in my own coaching rounds, was Ray, you must coach yourself out of a job. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. And that has stuck with me. Mm. So we can, brilliant people, all I do is keep a coaching hat on all the time. Mm. And coaching is not telling people what to do. Coaching is giving them, in my my view, giving them the platform to raise their fears and concerns, improve their understandings, Mm. allow them to interpret it in their own fashion, Mm. and then apply it Mm. in the setting that they are, or the arena that they are in. Mm. And it's, it's our current team of leadership, they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Some of them are very efficient with paper, but they need work with some of the people's sides. Whereas the others, some of them is like real driven in curriculum and business side, but their paperwork is just shocking. Mm. And we just try and fill the gap yeah. and allow them to be brilliant. Instead of just detracting on what they're not doing very well, let's just find ways to minimize that and let them be brilliant. Mm. Because people are brilliant. Yeah. People are brilliant and uh, yeah, but that's hard because in a scaled in a scaled scenario, that makes sense. But I think people need to be aware: are they, when they're going into business, are they buying themselves a job, or are they buying a business? Are they growing or developing a business yeah. to scale? Yeah, it's got to be scalable. Eh? It has to. Or, or, and I'm okay with people buying themselves a job because it means that they're kind of on their own freedom. Yeah. It's like people who mow lawns or. You know, all those sorts of yeah, things. Yeah, the flexibility. Flexibility, yeah. time for no, right. their kids. And, and, and I value that. If that's what their value is, which is more time for their children, and, yeah. you know, they're not working a nine to five, and they can get it all done in school hours and, and pick up and support their wife who might have a great career or something, you know, really? cool. I love that. Yeah. I love that and, and all power to them. Mm-hmm. But you've got to, be def- you've got to be definitive about that. Yeah, you've got to know. You've got to know. Is. Am I yeah. buying a business? Am I buying a job or am I buying a business that can scale? Once you've decided on the business that can scale, you've got to realize your own shortcomings and where the hell you get out of the way. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's been about find brilliant people, empower them, give them everything they really need because mm-hmm. the success doesn't need to rely on you as the, as the founder. And I've spoken about it earlier. The sooner you can get your DNA out of the way, the better. Absolute gold. Yeah. So, mm. so, so good. Um, so important and there's so much in this podcast recording that uh, listeners will be able to draw from and, and implement into their own business, which is cool. Mm. But to wrap us up, I would love to ask the question here a little bit more about what excites you of the future of your business? Yeah. Um, there are some real areas that of growth in technology. Yeah. Um, so the governments, any governments, no government is going to take away the support and funding for um, early childhood. It, in fact, it'll increase mm. because the, and what the pandemic's shown is that both parents have to go to work. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what technology will do, because how they, because they pour so much money into it, the government puts in place compliance. Now right. the compliance piece yeah. Because they have to, they have to find a way to justify the money being spent. Of course, yeah. However, where it gets where it gets blurred is that the value that we as teachers bring on the product is a grey. It's grey area. It's love, care, relationships, connection, respect. Mm. How do you measure that? Mm. You can't. You can't measure that. Yeah. You can't tick box that. Yeah. Typically you can't walk in and go, oh, cool. Tick, yep, they have a relationship. Tick, yep, there's love there. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah, yeah. All the compliance pieces around paperwork and things like that, like collecting how many times they've been, they changed their nappies and mm. sleep charts and stuff mm. like that. And it's so old-fashioned. Mm. And in that scenario, going back to our process, which is around that we're a teacher development company, we want to use teachers' experiences to really develop and I've had a couple of conversations with people around the tech site um, including Mike Denner he's my mm-hmm. mentor and probably certainly needs a word uh, needs a mention on this podcast great um, around where do we speed that up so for example um, we have to collect data on sleep mm-hmm. but the data is not you, you don't use it it's just a tick sheet. Mm. Now, data gathering for data gathering, for someone to come in and comb over, mm. it doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. Like, that's just a waste of time and resource. Yeah. But it's got to be done. Mm. So that's exciting. I think we... Yeah. And that's one thing 
where I really am. It's it's trying to find people who are who are brave enough to take on the technology. Mm. Like I've spoken to developers, it scares them because they think it's quite big, mm. and we have to deal with the Ministry of Education, mm. and they're hard to deal with. So, but that's exciting, and I don't. Yeah, you know, that's where I really want to innovate in that space. Exciting, yeah. If you could crack that, eh, it's definitely scalable across. So the product you would offer onto other early childhood centers and all that, yeah, great. Around the world, yeah, around the world, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, the other one really is continuing the to find. Look, I, I think right now how we train teachers doesn't work. Mm-hmm. How we are attracting teachers into the job isn't isn't working so the Mm -hmm. tertiary space is very interesting to me that it's probably if we're looking at R&D if we're talking about another seat at the table Mm -hmm. we are really heavily looking into that space Mm -hmm. in teacher training Mm -hmm. not just ECE but primary and secondary because we are finding how I kind of liken it is it's like if I tell you to just run for two minutes a day and then spring on you that right now you're going to go and run a marathon Mm. Um, a lot of people some people might get through the marathon and think oh yeah I'll carry on running majority of people don't Yeah, we're finding that in, with teaching young teachers are coming out of uni or they're coming out of because these old establishments like the universities they want to gatekeep mm. the methodology of training teachers mm. when really like an apprenticeship mm. if we were to pull them on the job with very experienced people mm that can guide them through that step by step, day by day, we will find, I believe, a greater um, retention, Mm. especially in those early years, because they're saying five years people are lasting. Wow. That's a very short career for a $40,000, $50,000 degree. Yeah, yeah, of course. It doesn't make sense. No, no. Um, So I think the innovation's gotta come in the approach, but we've gotta break down I, I admire what universities do, don't get me wrong, and there's places for research and things, but we have to innovate mm-hmm. what it looks like because there is a severe shortage of skilled teachers within New Zealand, mm-hmm. um, and we, we, we just there's no way that we can keep up um, what people are trying to achieve in, in this space without quality people. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a cool point of innovation that we could really... Mm. capitalize on yeah that's awesome some groundbreaking ideas there that yeah um yeah no doubt that you and the team and and courtney and, and everyone just you know yeah. really charge on and and make happen over time so yeah fully backing you guys in that thank you yeah and honestly just like i don't know if it sounds weird but just yeah be really proud of yourself i think thank you. like hearing your story and um meeting you and um, just seeing the type of person that you are and the type of leader that you are um, not coming from the easiest of circumstances and building the life that you've got now is extremely inspiring to others so thank you like so much for sharing your story yeah. and um, and and doing the program and, and just being who you are and, and continuing to improve every day I think it's yeah. so inspiring to many so thank you no I appreciate it I do uh, and I do want to give a shout out to Mike Dennehy who yes. was my who is still is yeah. we still catch up we're catching up a couple, um, so he was my mentor yeah. assigned from Ice House oh, so brilliant cool. guy Warriors fan I'm a huge <laughs> Warriors fan he um, I was wearing a Warriors jersey when on my first meeting with him here he walked in he said oh a Warriors fan you know he and a lot of what he does encompasses it in terms of relationships he got to know who I was as a person mm. he was he's brilliant and now I consider him a mate um, and seriously the connection through it with Mike through Ice House has been because I've got my father-in-law who's done well in business and he's he's one of my best friends and he is a mentor mm. but we need more than one and, yeah. and Mike has, has grown into a very cool piece of the puzzle because mm. um, I hear about his own experiences in a different business and things and yeah that piece there is a phenomenal piece of what Ice House does mm. is connect you with brilliant people like Mike mm. Mm. that's so cool and that sort of covers that piece of what next to the Ice House is that that coaching element and yeah. once you can get like you have with Mike a solid relationship with one of our coaches or someone within our network or community and it's not just a moment in time, but you know, you've got that connection for life mm. and it's deep. I think that's well, where the habit. Things. You know, yeah. it's James Clear going back. It's the, you know, 
um, it becomes part of your system. Mm. You know, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. Mm. He has become a critical piece of my system. Yeah. Because he's he's not in the business. Mm. So Courtney's dad supports us with a mentorship around over there and yeah. helps with financial finances and things. He actually knows the intricacies of the business. Yeah. Mike doesn't. Mm. Mike's there to um, really listen and objectively give opinions and, and he honestly he's just a good fella. Yeah. Um, that's probably if if I'm saying if there's any piece of ice house that I love, that's probably the biggest piece. So cool. Which is the coaching um, uh, mentorship because I've asked him some pretty tough questions um, and he's been able to give me great responses one question I asked him was like Mike do you think I could be a CEO of another company mm. and you know because that's a question I always ask myself is my skill set good enough to go and lead other companies mm. outside of education and things like that yeah. um, and it's something I constantly work on um, around that space because interesting. Um, I've got aspirations around other things as well um, but Mike is just such a critical piece of, mm. of that scenario. Mm. Good guy. Good yeah, guy. Great guy. Yeah yeah. 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 So cool, Ray. Thank you so much for having <laughs> sitting down, having a good old conversation with us, for sharing your story. I can't thank you enough. And it's just really cool to get to know you um, and, and see where you guys are heading. So the Ice House team, we're backing you all the way. And... Uh, yeah. yeah, excited to see what the future holds. I guess one thing, if you want to reach out to me, I am on Instagram. My, my, my um, profile's open. It's cool. just either weightlifting or my kids, um, <laughs> uh, or the Warriors. Um, uh, Ray underscore Everest, if you want to get in touch. I'm always keen to talk business and connect. Yeah, um, that, you know Those sort of things are, are really important to me. Mm. Um, yeah, no, that's the cool. access. So, But yeah. thank you very much. I really, I do really appreciate this. <laughs> Right, it's been cool. It's been very cool.